A young man stands in his bedroom on the day of April 13th, 2009, yada yada yada. This is a good time to note that playing Homestuck is told in a manner emulating an adventure game that the reader is playing, but all of the plot advancing commands have already been typed in, so all we have to do is click to the next page. Sticking to the standard trope of adventure games, despite the fact that it is his boy's 13th birthday, it is only today he will be given a name. Narration determines this name to be John Egbert, and he is excited to play the beta release of Spurb. Retrieving and installing the game involves a lot of time dicking around on John's part, which is to say the audience's part. After connecting with his server player, Rose, he continues to dick around while she explores the basics of the game, recording her observations through GameFAQs.com. Through Spurb, Rose is able to view John's house on her computer screen and interact with his environment, reminiscent of the Sims series. She is given a display view of her game options and John's construction resources. She deploys various machines in his house which John, as the client player, must operate. They end up merging his kernel sprite with a maimed harlequin figure. Unfortunately, Rose's power cuts out due to a violent rainstorm outside, and she must venture out to find a generator. On the way there, she runs into her mom and engages in video game style combat wherein she is given a pony as a gift. Back at John's house, a meteor destroys his neighborhood as he takes a bite of an apple spawned by one of the game's machines. John's house is transported to the Incipisphere and infested by imps, sitting atop a cliff above the clouds on a mysterious shady planet. John begins to hear a voice in his head, planted by a machine from years in the future, but not many, operated by his exile, a wayward vagabond. Any imps that John slays yields him build grist and other resources, allowing Rose to build up his house, Sim style. The game also includes the concept of alchemy, allowing players to combine two or more objects for practical purposes or combat purposes. When John enters, the Colonel Sprite divides, giving all the enemies a Harlequin-themed look. The Sprite seeks a second merging, and ends up being combined with Nana's ashes, and John Egbert finally gets to meet the pastry-baking, practical joke-playing woman who raised his dad. Rose's internet connection is lost while trying to use Smurb to retrieve John's dad's car, which contains an unopened birthday package from Jade and his server copy of the game. The car plummets into the abyss below. Dad, by the way, has been captured by imps and is being held prisoner in the Kingdom of Darkness. Here we meet the Jack Noir of this game session, with the same generic hatred towards the Black Queen, this time in the form of his disdain towards the Harlequin-themed dress code. Dad stirs up a fuss by fighting off and severely overpowering low-ranking jailers with cake and shaving cream, necessitating Jack's attention. Dad destroys Jack's hat, a gesture which is much appreciated and he's allowed to go free. Rose's mom descends into her fortress-like science lab, preparing for the destruction of Earth wherein she will face trials similar to that of John's dad. Her horse follows, and eventually rows herself to a different part of the lab with mutated cats and a big monitor screen tracking the various meteors and their imminent collisions. John uses the game's alchemic devices to merge various items around his house, fashioning himself a couple powerful combat hammers, hands-free computing devices, and a sweet outfit. Meanwhile, Dave has spilled apple juice on his copies of the game, so he hangs them out to dry, and later, a flock of birds fly through the window. He loses the game discs, the crow gets impaled by a shitty sword, and as a result, he must ask to borrow his bro's copy of the disc. Bro will give Dave the discs, but only after two rounds of thorough ass-kicking between the boys plus Lil' Cal. Jade tends to her garden, fools around, takes a few naps, and then goes adventuring on her volcanic island home. She enters the Frog Temple ruins for the first time. Until now, Becquerel has prevented her attempts by teleporting her away with his first guardian powers. Inside the ruin, she finds a time capsule seed about to open, inside which are a set of suburb game discs, the ones belonging to Dave. It is at this time Rose installs her client disc, connecting with Dave as her server player to save herself from a meteor shower, with power outages in her house being a consistent obstacle. 
By this time, she has built John's house high enough to reach the first gate, one of seven, equidistant and in line between his planet and Skya. Dave deploys the game's equipment and combines the kernel with a large tentacle princess plush after Rose combines it with a corpse of her dead cat. Taxidermy, by the way, plays a few important plot keys in this story. Did I mention Jade's grandpa is stuffed and posed in front of the fireplace? Anyway, after a bunch of combat and a few boss battles on John's part, he jumps through his first gate. Act 4 John finds himself on the ground on the planet below his house, inhabited by yellow salamanders and blue mushrooms, dubbed the Land of Wind and Shade, completely shrouded by dark clouds and countless fireflies trapped within them. He takes some time to explore the land and fight bad guys, with his exile on Earth communicating with him from the future. There are various Mario-esque pipes protruding from the ground which serve as mailboxes that grant wishes made by carving stone tablets. John wishes for his server copy of Spurt. Meanwhile, the frequency at which the trolls contact him and his friends increases, with Terezi giving him some pointers about his planet. Rose, with her house now part of the game, goes through similar trials as John, fighting imps that are now half Harlequin, half Cat Princess themed, using her sewing needles for combat, while Dave builds her house up higher. The White Queen from the future establishes her techno-telepathic connection with Rose, who opts for a more analytical approach to playing this game, rather than John's methods of smashing enemies. Rose, of course, continues to update her Game Facts page. Jade installs her archaeologically acquired disc and connect with Dave, acting as his client and deploying the machinery into his environment. His kernel is combined with a sword-impaled bird from earlier, who then makes a nest from junk around his house, including the pieces of Little Cow, who had been sliced up in the aforementioned ass-kicking. In this nest is a mysterious egg spawned by the game, similar to John's apple, which will hatch upon Dave's entry. On the Land of Wind and Shade, John's dad's car has crashed onto the ground from the cliff above and has been caution taped off and cited for illegal parking by a black chess guy serving as an authority regulator. He confiscates John's birthday package and suburb server copy to be brought to the royal palace for processing. A white chess gal serving as a parcel mistress with a passion for rightful mail delivery witnesses the authority regulator confiscating the package and envelope and recalls a mysterious request from one of Jade's time letters involving that very package. John's stone wishing tablet then pops through the pipe right next to her and with a burst of heroic gusto she politely asks the authority regulator for them so she may see to their proper delivery. Respecting the stone carving system, he gives her the envelope, but declines the package, informing her that she must go through his superiors regarding this contraband. She makes her way to the Dark Kingdom's planet and enters the royal castle, where the Black Queen directs her to the office of Jack Noir for citation inquiry. Jack gives the parcel mistress a sword and tells her she can have the package if she brings him the White King's scepter and White Queen's ring. Or their crowns, that detail is kind of foggy. During John's adventure through the land of Wind and Shade, we catch a brief glimpse of Jade's grandpa, apparently having traveled through time to be part of the game. He also carries a copy of the old Colonel's joke book, and assumedly around this time steals a window wall from Jack Noir's office. A fourth wall, to be exact. Back in the Light Kingdom, the White Queen surprisingly surrenders her ring and sends the parcel mistress off to the battlefield where the king can be found. While she is boarding a warship, a courtyard droll from the Dark Kingdom picks her pocket and makes off with the ring. But fortunately for the narrative, Jade's dream self is there to whoop the droll and claim it. Jade then follows the ship towards the battlefield, 